station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Ready for the event. KNSD TV, San Diego. This is Mission Control, Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Great. Hi, Stacia. This is Brooke from KNSD. I can hear you. I can uh, I can hear you now, Brooke. Wonderful, Commander Dominic. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we'll get right to it. It's it's great to speak with you. Uh, you've been aboard the International Space Station since March as commander of NASA's SpaceX Crew-8 mission. And I wanted you to kind of take me through your role as a flight engineer. What does that entail and what does an average day look like for you? Uh, the best part about it is there's no such thing as an average day. It's all over the board. It's something new all the time. Uh, we have an incredible group of teams, uh, incredible group of folks around the entire planet who put together our day for us. And we wake up and, and we call it following the red line, where there's a line that goes across a computer screen and tells us where to be, what to do, and what to work on. So we might be working on an experiment one day, uh, doing maintenance another day. You know, today they were fixing a pump that manages our water supply system all over the board. And it's, it's truly an adventure every single day. And you are an alumnus of the University of San Diego, which is where I am right now in San Diego. Was there a moment during your time there where you realized that you wanted to do this? You wanted to become a NASA astronaut? I think uh, my desire to explore uh, the world and, and, and the cosmos around me uh, started well before University of San Diego, but uh, going to there you know, certainly helped keep that, that dream alive. Uh, it, it was a beautiful time down there at 5998 Alcala Park and uh, had a wonderful experience there doing engineering, but also a liberal arts university. So it gave me a wide breadth of understanding, not just laser focused on engineering. And you know what, we actually spoke with a USD student studying mechanical engineering and he has aspirations to become an astronaut and just even work in the space industry. I wanted to ask you, there's other students like him, of course, what is some advice that you could provide for them if they have aspirations similar to what you've achieved and what you're doing now? Oh, there's so many things you can do in the space industry. Uh, it's it's a diverse field of just so many possible things. Aerospace is the first thing people think, so you know, rocket engines, but uh, you need absolutely everything. I'm surrounded by all kinds of experiments and research and wires and systems up here. You need to understand biology. You need to understand me mechanical engineering, electrical engineering. We need lawyers to put together the contracts for the different countries to work together. Uh, a, a friend of mine now is working space law. Uh, it needs all types. So the best thing I think you can do is go pick something you love because then you'll be good at it and you'll just it won't feel like work at all. That's great advice. And you also have a Master of Science in Systems Engineering, and that's from the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, but you're also a graduate of the U.S. Naval Test Pilot School. I want to ask you, too, how did those experiences in education really prepare you for where you are now? I, I know that took a lot of work as well. Well, I mean, we're, we're at an incredibly amazing time right now. You know, one of the things I like to talk to folks is I run out of fingers when I ta start talking about the number of rocket ships that are, you know, the world is working on right now is launching into space. We're launching rockets, we're launching human rated spacecraft everywhere, uh, and it's really incredible. And that means we're, we're acquisitioning the fancy term, or we're developing new spacecraft. And so that involves testing them and understanding them. Uh, that involves, you know, trying to make the tough engineering decisions. Uh, and it just, you know, test pilot school was for aircraft, but now we do it for spacecraft and very, very similar. And this is the, the kind of fun question I wanted to ask you that we added in here. How does water behave in microgravity? Can you give us an example? <laughs> Oh, absolutely. So my, uh, 
when I when I I'm, I have two daughters and uh, I'll call my wife and she'll put them on video chat all the time and my daughters will invariably be with one of their friends and my younger daughter loves it. She's always like, "Hey, daddy, daddy, you got to show them the water thing. You got to show them the water thing." It's like the first thing out of their mouth. They have to prove that her dad's in space. So I always uh, have a water bag nearby now. Most of the time, when you have a water bag, you you drink from the straw like any sane human up here. But uh, a lot of the times, hey, why not? Uh, you got to make a bubble of water because it's just fun. So we absolutely do that all the time. It's one of my more favorite things to do. Um, learning how to do this took a little bit of time. But you could just have a floating bubble of water. But you know what? The best thing to do is when a crewmate happens to be flying by, they might intercept your bottle of water, <laughs> your bubble of water, <laughs> and just eat it for you, and it disappears. <laughs> Thank you for But, uh, you know, that. since he stole the show there, I'm happy to make another one. So, you know, yeah, we work pretty hard up here. We take it pretty seriously. But uh, our free time is also a blast. I'll make sure this water doesn't hit the camera. <laughs> wow. I love seeing that. Thank you for showing me. And I loved the, uh, the extra that popped in there, too. <laughs> <laughs> that that was not planned, but that's part of space station life. We got people coming and going left and right all the time, and it's 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 a lot of fun when somebody comes flying through your PAO. But and, and I'm not joking; it actually is a blast. It looks like it. <laughs> we'll move right along to the next question. Uh, what was your journey like up to the ISS? I mean, what was? Can you kind of explain to what it's like living and working there, and what it was like actually getting there too? Uh, that's a lot. Uh, so getting up here, I, I have the, you know these very couple very clear memories of the launch to get up here. The first was that just that first you know when the the time hit zero and you lift it off, it just this really cool but bizarre lifting up of your body, like you're just being lifted up. It was very weird. I've done a lot of catapult shots, flying aircraft for the Navy, uh, flown a lot of different airplanes, but there was just nothing quite like that same feeling. It was very smooth and it was just very lift off, and then also that sensation of uh, when the first stage cuts off and you kind of get, you kind of have this weird floating feeling because you are, you know, you're in free fall briefly before the second engine lights off the second stage and then the second stage throws you back. Uh, something I'll never forget. And uh, then also just unstrapping and floating out of your seat uh, and just looking out the window for the first time and seeing the curvature of the earth. Uh, it's not enough words can do it justice. Uh, and then working up here is, is great. The commute is short. Uh, I live over there, uh, or I sleep over there, and I eat there, and I work in between, so it's pretty convenient. Did you have any jet lag, too, when you got up there? Uh, so, I mean, we, we sleep shift uh, a fair bit operationally if we need to, if we got a, a new spacecraft coming up and we know we need to get up early or need to go to bed late. Um, it, it's, it, you just work with it. It's just like time zone shifting on Earth. Uh, we've gotten pretty used to it. We do it on a regular basis. Uh, the lights in here are designed to, to mimic some outside lights. We can turn them into really bright sunlight to help us uh, shift our circadian rhythm. Uh, so we, we do a lot of sleep shifting. In fact, we sleep shifted a couple days ago to, to, catch, to catch our cargo vehicle, which is now right down there on the floor. Awesome. And can you share with me too, I mean, what time zone are you technically in and following? We, uh, we, we follow GMT, so Greenwich Mean Time right there, uh, same time as London. Um, and we just picked one that's convenient for some of the major control centers around the world. But uh, it's just, you know, go pick a time zone and stick with it. It's what we've done for 20 plus years of human spaceflight up here. And you already mentioned this too, when you demonstrated the microgravity, you mentioned your family. Is it easy to stay connected with them and FaceTime them on a consistent basis? It's it gets better and better. I mean, we we are the satellite, uh, and it's pretty cool. You know, we are a satellite orbiting Earth, and we send our communications to another satellite, which beams them to back to Earth, and then through some fiber optic wires into Houston and out to our family. Uh, it's pretty convenient. Uh, we have pretty good internet connections, so I can. You know, I mean, to be honest, sometimes while I'm working out, I'm on video chat. Uh, I've lifted weights today, talking to my wife and kids. And uh, it, it's you can stay well connected pretty easily. What is your plan after your mission is complete? What's next for you? 
Uh, it, it's actually going to similar to what we did in the Navy uh, when I was in flight test for the Navy. We would go to an operational squadron, meaning we, we would go deploy, go around the world, do the the mission of the Navy. Then we would come back to flight test, and then we go back and operate. So when I go back. Uh, my hope is to go contribute to the development uh, of new spacecraft, having had this operational experience and going back and forth between development and operations, just so you can give the operator's perspective uh, into flight test. And I wanted to ask you too, I mean, I know you're so busy up there. What do you do when you have downtime and you're not necessarily on the clock or are you always on the clock? I mean, I feel like I'm not always on the clock up here. Floating to work makes it doesn't feel like it make it feel like it's work. Uh, when we'd have downtime, I'm taking pictures a lot. In fact, I was looking at the start of this PAO event, going, "Oh man," because I've got a I've got a camera running over in the Russian segment in a window I've been experimenting with lately, taking deep sky images of the Milky Way. And uh, that time lapse is going to be done here in a minute. And so I had to ask one of my crewmates to go turn it off for me because it's supposed to be ending right now. Well, Commander Dominic, thank you so much for making some time for us today. It was such a pleasure speaking with you from Earth, and I wish you the best. Thank you for everything. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Great talking to you, and I'll tell you what, San Diego weather is amazing. Enjoy it. Oh, we will. Thanks. <laughs> Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes the event. Thank you to all participants. Station, we're now resuming operational audio communications.